Could there be methane in these bubbles rising from the sea floor in the Siberian Arctic? If a substantial amount of the methane that is frozen under the Arctic was to be released within a decade, the consequences would be disastrous for the global climate. According to the Stern Review, it would cost society an amazing $60 trillion, roughly equivalent to the global GDP. Well, we know that uh, there is a very large proportion of the global soil carbon is uh, uh, held up in the uh, surface soils, frozen surface soils around the Arctic, the permafrost, uh, also existing in the shallow sea bottom. We also know, based on research primarily over the past decade, uh, that uh, there is carbon being released both from uh, coastal permafrost and subsea permafrost and also from the, the various potential methane reservoirs in the, in the sea bottom. There is no doubt that we have a change in the Arctic. There is no doubt that we have had, for example, uh, a trend of successively less sea ice and possibly even going to sea ice free summers. But that trend is very important to understand the reasons behind it. Why is it happening? And uh, there are natural variations in the climate system and in the environmental system. So uh, for us, a lot of our research is to really figure out what is what, what is caused by our actions on the planet and what is caused by the, the climate system. Most likely you can't 100% separate these two components. But it's very important to know our role and what we possibly can do to, to reduce our role. Swirus C3 is an international research expedition conducted from the icebreaker Odin in the Arctic Ocean. The expedition is a Swedish-Russian-American collaboration with 80 researchers from 14 different countries. Odin will travel along the Russian Arctic coast to Barrow in Alaska and then over the underwater mountain range, the Lomonosov Ridge, near the North Pole before it returns to Tromsø roughly 100 days later. So we really need to have the full picture. I think in all this science, if we would focus on a question that someone think is very, very pressing, and trying to only go on that question and, and forget the context around that question. We can't resolve that question. We must get the context around it. Otherwise, it's kind of useless or we, we, we will not be able to resolve it. The climate has varied throughout Earth's history. 200,000 years ago, the sea level here was around 120 meters lower. What is now the sea floor was huge steppe areas where mammoths grazed. The process in which organic materials such as plants and animals are broken down produces carbon gases. These gases have accumulated in the Earth's surface over millions of years, and when the Earth became colder, deep permafrost settled on this surface like a lid. When the temperature in these areas rises, and as the permafrost begins to thaw, carbon can be released in the form of methane. If this carbon and methane pools may be released partially perhaps, at least on land, due to, uh, due to climate warming. Uh, that could add additional carbon in the form of the strong greenhouse gas methane to the atmosphere. So that would, uh, in that sense, has a potential to serve as a positive feedback to, to climate warming. Uh, we don't uh, have much evidence that that is a, a process or a strong process going on right now. But since the, so much carbon and methane exists in this system, and we know that there is thawing of permafrost on land and in the subsea, uh, we need to better understand uh, the, these uh, potential thawing and release and transport mechanisms. 
and that's where the Zero C3 program fills an important gap in a previously very little explored but important area of the Arctic. To be able to measure the methane isotopes in the water, scientists are preparing containers with special taps which they use to add helium to the water samples, allowing them to measure methane levels. The different research groups are responsible for their own analysis and sampling equipment. Martin and Orian make sure that everything fits on board and functions effectively so that research can be carried out continuously. There are a lot of challenges and, uh, and a lot of questions before an expedition. It could be, for example, that uh, we would like, preferably, to go to a certain place uh, that no one ever been to before, that is very poorly charted, and then we have to assess the risk of taking the icebreaker there, and that, that is, uh, for example, uh, something that we cannot do alone, that has to be done, of course, with the person in charge of the vessel, the captain. What is a station? So let's talk briefly about that. And it's not a straightforward uh, question, actually, as one might think. When you're drifting and, you know, maybe working over three or four hours and you're exactly sampling at the, along, you know, a drift line. A group of so scientists meets to solve some of the many the, practical problems an expedition of this kind any, faces. Any, <coughs> there are many practical aspects about planning the expedition. Uh, the biggest one is, of course, to agree to a cruise plan. Where are we going to go and what we're going to do? How much time of our valuable cruise hours we're going to invest for different activities? So that is a, a, a major planning project ahead of an expedition. Sverus is the most complicated expedition that has ever been done on Odin in the terms that we put so many different researchers with all their equipment on board at the same time. At Tromsø on the 4th of July 2014, Odin's journey north begins. It was uh, a day of uh, great anticipation. Um, it was good to finally get to leave and actually execute the real research expedition after a long period of preparations. Odin is a fantastic research platform and uh, it's considered of some the, the world's best research icebreaker for heavy ice conditions. During the journey, the collection and analysis of metrology data is carried out continuously, along with air and water measurements and the scanning of the seabed beneath the ocean. Scientists on board work in shifts. They prepare equipment and tune their instruments before arriving at the first station, an area in the southwestern Nansen Basin in the Laptev Sea. The feeling to enter into these uh, vast areas of the Arctic is rather great. And I would say that I don't think about it all the time during the expedition, but over the years I've learned to stop every now and then and, and just take a moment and reflect on it. And I think that those moments are very valuable. And as soon as we see any wildlife, that really makes this feeling rather fantastic. I think this, those moments you, you capture, you remember. So when we reached first station, everyone, of course, were very excited and focused on the task. And of course, there's some nervousness about new systems really being put to test 
in the real conditions for the first time. The piston corer is a Swedish invention from the 1950s that has become standard equipment for sampling long sediment cores. This allows researchers to dig back through history by studying the different layers of sediments that have accumulated during different periods, like an archive of climate history. So we had prepared ourselves and agreed that we would take the first station very slow and methodologically uh, to make sure that everything would work out. The piston cora is a long tube called a barrel with a heavy weight on top and a piston at the bottom. The trigger, positioned parallel to the barrel, protrudes a little below the tip of the tube. When the trigger touches the sea floor, the cora is released down into the sediment. By analysing the different layers of sediment, scientists can see how the climate has varied throughout the ages. A lot of things that are happening in the ocean can be represented in the sediments because, for example, if you have microorganisms that live in the ocean that have a shell of calcium carbonate, that means that they need to build this shell and they do that by using the ocean water and, and use the calcium and build their shell with. And that means that you lock in the chemistry into these organisms which comes from the ocean water at the time when they lived. So then we can, for example, analyze the organisms in terms of chemistry and then we can reconstruct how the ocean was. It took a lot of time in the first station. Uh, I remember ice was drifting in where we wanted to put the equipment down into the water. So uh, delaying deployment. But eventually we got to take the samples that we, we were there to take and uh, the different key systems worked out and had then proven themselves. So then, then we had really started the expedition and could uh, force ahead. One of the prime focus of Sveros was to figure out, first of all, how much gas do we have entrapped in the slope sediments? Secondly, what will happen if we increase the bottom water temperature in this area? Gas hydrates are gas which, at a certain pressure and temperature, solidifies, the results of which can be, for example, frozen methane. It has been speculated that hydrates in the sediments on the Arctic continental slopes would be destabilized if the temperature changes. This would result in the release of methane gas which could bubble up through the water and potentially be released into the atmosphere. The first findings of elevated methane in the, uh, in the seawater was when we came from uh, the uh, Amundsen Basin, which is a deep basin, 2,000, 3,000 meter deep, in the area where we were, and came up on the continental slope and the upper slope at the water depth uh, water column depth of 300 250 meters. We found uh, indications of a uh, lot of bubbles in the water column. And when we sampled those bubbles, uh, we could uh, on the ship uh, confirm that that was uh, high levels of methane. Okay, print this screen. Can draw by hand a little bit to try to draw up the shape of the, the banana. Yeah, this is the central language for all the first time. This is different than uh, what has earlier been documented of methane release up on the continental shelf, the, the, the shallow seas. And a few findings have been there uh, in small areas around Svalbard, but no documentation in this vast area of the Arctic, the eastern Arctic. So this was the first uh, documentation of that. 
In 2008, during a Swedish-Russian expedition with Orion Gustafsson, it was discovered for the first time that methane was being released from the sea floor on the continental shelf. We also meaningfully revisited a couple of hotspots that had been detected on earlier expeditions where we methane kept on coming off in, in, in large amounts. Uh, and the objective of revisiting these places was to get a better understanding of what the source of that methane is from the subsea system, because there are several potential sources. One of them being uh, methane that is frozen into the uh, drowned uh, soil and, and uh, peatlands that were in these regions um, uh, before. They were drowned by the rising sea level that occurred when the glaciers were melting at the end of the Ice Age. That's one potential source. Another potential source is a deeper thermogenic or petrogenic source of natural gas, basically. Uh, that could be at several hundreds of thousand meter depth. That um, now is able to penetrate up this methane through cracks in, the, in a thawing permafrost near the surface. In addition to making atmospheric, sea floor and water measurements, researchers take hundreds of sediment samples with a so-called multicora. A multicorer is a type of sediment corer that take more than one sediment sample at one particular sampling site. The advantage of that is that you have duplicates. The expedition, which has mapped large parts of the Siberian seas, has given scientists a clear understanding of the distribution of methane. In most of the areas mapped, the amount of methane does not diverge from background levels. However, in certain areas, levels of methane were found to be elevated, in some cases by a factor of 100 or more. Researchers regularly send up weather balloons from the helideck. They measure air pressure, relative humidity and temperature at various altitudes as the balloon rises through the atmosphere. The balloon is equipped with GPS, which also allows scientists to calculate wind speed. Kan vi köra ut när ser till den? Ja visst.
CTD is a water collection system that consists of some 24 Niskin water bottles constructed in the form of a rosette. When it's lowered in the water column, the operator can close bottles at different water depth so that we can get the profile of a property of the water, both physical properties and uh, chemical constituents that are measured both uh, directly on the water in the bottles or taken home from the home laboratory or sensors to this, uh, uh, this system. This can be helpful in understanding how water moves at different depths and if the rising temperatures on the sea bottom are partly caused by changes in currents. Research on what happens when the climate gets warmer has no value unless you can put it in context. This means that we have to understand the whole history of the Earth's climate system, including glacial and interglacial periods. In the 1970s, the scientist John Hayworth Mercer wrote an article in which he speculated that it would have been possible for a large ice sheet to have been formed in the central Arctic during the last ice age. He built his hypothesis on something that was said at the end of the 19th century. The suggestion was that if you were to close off the Arctic from other oceans, a thick floating ice shelf would then develop, reminiscent of that found in West Antarctica. Researchers Terry Hughes and Misha Groswold further developed this theory. This has been very debated. Several people thought it was pretty crazy and some believed in it. I would say that into the 80s and the 90s, this was more or less dismissed. During the Odin expedition in 1996, Martin and his colleagues made the first discovery of a number of areas eroded by ice on the seafloor in the central Arctic, a sign that in the past there had been several kilometres of thick ice here. The possibility that the ice sheet could be as large as in Merthyr's hypothesis was dismissed by scientists. This part that we covered by Sverus, we thought previously were not touched on these water depths around 1,000 meters by ice. When the expedition reached the underwater mountain range, the Lomonosov Ridge, scientists on board Odin made a sensational discovery. <laughs> It's so exciting to do multi-beam mapping, it's a little bit like treasure hunting and, and you can't see through the ocean, so, but, but you see it with your acoustic eyes and it just on the screens it comes up. Fantastic records. We just see these landforms on the seafloor that are formed by ice all over. Och det är nog så in i helvete coolt. Här har du alltså isen som har gått rätt över hela ryggen här. Du ser det som kratsspår här. Det här är stora saker. Det, det, det här är ju en, en, som du tänker upp i fjällen, en, en massiv då som går från 1050 till 750 meter här. Så det, det är liksom 300 meter stup här efter. Och sen så, så ser man tydligt hur en tusen meter tjock is har gått över hela området och bara kammat hela ryggen här. Det här är, det här är ett omslag till en cool vetenskaplig blaska. Det är liksom hur tydligt som helst här. Så att de här spåren här då, de, de är typ 300-400 meter, meter breda. Så det är inga små krattningar. But there's a lot of things you can learn from it. Right now, we have the issue of West Antarctica, where we know that the, the Pine Island Bay region and certain regions are, are rather vulnerable. We see there's a lot of things happening there. And we see that warm water is coming closer. We don't really know how it's going to be react, how much can go away in a, in a fast time. Same thing with Greenland, the outlet glaciers of Greenland. We don't. Some of them have increased rapidly lately, and we don't really know the future behavior of them. We have a record of the past where we can see that the Arctic today don't have any of these huge ice shelves anymore. They're all gone. 
but they leave traces behind on the seafloor. So you can study this and learn how fast did this happen, in what way did it happen. Did it happen successively, slowly, or boom, with collapses and so forth? This is what we can learn from. And then we can use this knowledge to, to see where we are today and maybe trying to get an idea where we're going. On the 4th of October, Odin returns from Tromsø loaded with data, samples of water and seabed sediments. And here, the Swira C3 project will enter the next and longest phase. Right now we are doing a lot of analysis. And uh, for example, we're doing a lot, of, we have sent samples for dating. We do more chemistry analysis of, for example, pore water on the sediment cores. Other work is already on the stage that you, you got most of the results during the ship. And then we are sitting there and trying to synthesize it into to uh, scientific articles to present the results. So there, there's a lot of different part. This uh, expedition, the Sphero C3 expedition, uh, had the great benefit of being able to fit uh, so many different research groups with complementary uh, equipment and expertise. So we, we could uh, take samples and observe the system uh, from many different angles. And this is going to be a great benefit to the post expedition phase of, of the campaign, where uh, we will have uh, the possibility to not only have our own specialized set of data, each of us, but that we will benefit a lot from, from now working together and having access to this wealth of data that will put us in a much better position to collaboratively and together uh, shed, uh, shed more uh, complete light on, the, on this, uh, this system. And that is one of the benefits of, of working at uh, larger universities uh, like Stockholm University and in larger research programs like the Sphero C3 program. That um, this, some of these more complex systems that we are studying in the environment and in the climate system uh, you can uh, you can actually mobilize enough resources uh, to uh, to comprehend uh, a fuller part of the system. In the years following the expedition, researchers will be working with the material and publishing dozens of scientific articles, including one that may rewrite history. I think it's fantastic that we go back to an hypothesis that I was being myself very skeptical to. But it turns out that this hypothesis holds pretty, pretty well. So it, it's a rather fantastic feeling, I think. It's a good feeling to be wrong sometimes.